Although it seems like only yesterday, it was in fact about 20 years ago when the first luxury crossovers appeared in America. Back in 1998, Lexus kicked things off with the RX. That particular model blended components from the Lexus ES sedan, which was front wheel drive, with a box that looked like a more traditional crossover. Although some will say that the roundy style wasn't exactly that traditional. Then in 1999, we got the first BMW X5. But BMW went about things a little bit differently because they took a rear wheel drive vehicle and then put a square box on top. And that's exactly what we see out of this generation X5 again. This is somewhat related to the BMW 5 Series, just as that first X5 was way back in 1999. Some would argue that that actually makes the X5 more of a true crossover than the Lexus RX, because the RX really has more in common with an all-wheel drive minivan in terms of overall design than any of the truck-based SUVs out there. And at least the X5 has a rear-wheel drive layout, so engine up front, rear-wheel drive bias, although all models in America are all-wheel drive. Little bit of trivia here, the BMW X3 is actually about the same overall size as that first generation BMW X5 was way back when. Now why did BMW drop the third row? That's because the X7 is coming up soon. Up front, we have the latest iteration of BMW's definitely hungry front end design. Some folks have really lampooned this very vertical grill going on right here. Yes, it looks definitely hungry, but I actually don't think it's a problem. The X7 is a bit bigger, and I think that might be a little bit too big, but we have yet to actually see it here in person at Alex and Autos. The headlamps have also grown a little bit larger here. We have full LED headlamps standard and fog lamps down below standard on every X5. Let me know what you think about the overall look down there in the comment section below. I like the overall look of the X5, but I have to say that this is still definitely restrained and conservative. We don't see the same kind of wacky styling elements that we see in some of the American options. This model is about a foot longer than that original X5 at 194.3 inches long. That makes us about the same size overall as the three row Volvo XC90. It's about four inches longer overall than the Mercedes-Benz GLE, but about two inches shorter than a full-size Range Rover. Versus previous generations of the X5, you'll notice that we definitely have more overall interior legroom and a bigger cargo area. Most of the stretch in this generation, the X5, has gone both to the rear seats and to the cargo area in the back. That's one of the reasons that you might want to upgrade into an X5 from an X3 is for that extra rear seat room. That'll definitely be handy if you want to put rear-facing child seats back here or the extra cargo room in the rear. Out back, the X5 is instantly recognizable as a BMW. We have these distinctive tail lamp modules right there. Overall, a fairly vertical rear hatch. That's one of the big differences between this and the Lexus RX, which has a very raked profile overall. There's also some metal accents down here on the bumper to give it more of a rugged off-road look, and then twin integrated exhaust tips at the bottom. At the moment under this hood, we find two engines, but we do expect those to be joined by two additional engines coming up very soon. The model that we're driving here is the base engine, which is a three liter turbocharged inline six, produces 335 horsepower and 330 pound feet of torque. This is mated to an eight speed automatic transmission and all wheel drive is standard. The optional engine at the moment is a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8 that pumps things up to 456 horsepower and 479 pound feet of torque. Again, eight speed automatic and all wheel drive are standard. Combined fuel economy ranges from 22 miles per gallon for this model on down to 19 miles per gallon combined if you want the V8. If you want the best fuel economy in your X5, then hold on because there is a plug-in hybrid coming that should get a four-cylinder turbocharged engine plus BMW's latest plug-in hybrid system that'll give us 389 horsepower and likely about 50 miles of range, although we don't have exact details just yet. If you want more performance instead of better fuel economy, then look for an X5M coming up soon. Details are really sketchy on that particular model, but expect for it to be about 600 horsepower. It's probably going to be grabbing the same engine out of the new BMW X5. In our front seat comfort score, I'm gonna give these seats nine out of 10 points. We have inflatable bolsters, a four-way adjustable lumbar support, and an extending thigh cushion. This segment is full of some very, very comfortable seats. And if you pay more, you will get more comfortable seats in the X5, of course. Unlike the segment in which the BMW X3 plays, seats that have a wider variety of motion are pretty common in this larger segment, as are seats that provide optional massage functionality. So if that's what you're looking for, you'll definitely find it in some of the competition here. Keep in mind that in this more expensive two row crossover category, we do have a wider variety of different options available from BMW and from the competition when it comes to overall seat comfort. This model does have a power tilt telescopic steering column and it is memory linked with a two position memory over there on the door. And the passenger seat has the exact same range of motion as the driver's seat. 
Hopping into the back seat, legroom is overall generous, but you will find more legroom in many of the direct competition, including the Range Rover, the recently released Audi Q8, etc. That said, I still have about five inches of legroom left sitting right here behind myself, and that is again one of the big reasons that you might want to upgrade from an X3 into an X5. It means that rear-facing child seats and large adults are going to fit more comfortably back here. Some nice touches that we find back here are USB-C charge ports in the seat back. We also have a place where you can dock your rear seat entertainment system right there. We have four zone climate control in this particular model. So each of these zones has a climate zone. I have a camera there just hanging out for some reason. If I move all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, this front seat's all the way back in its tracks. You can see that I still have about four inches of legroom left. And headroom is very generous, even though this does have a panoramic moonroof right there. Kind of a surprising omission is that these second row seats do not have a recline functionality, and that's something that I wish BMW would have included. And then we have rear seats that fold in a 40-20 fashion. So this middle section right here folds independently of the outboard section, but if I fold the outboard section, then that actually does go right with it. For some reason, more and more manufacturers seem to be removing some of their more practical cargo carrying features. For instance, the new Toyota Highlander has removed the glass that opens separately. Other vehicles out there have lost the combination tailgate and liftgate, but not the X5. We still actually have one of its hallmark features, which is the combination liftgate and tailgate right here. Some people may not find this handy, but I love this particular feature. Not only does it give you somewhere to sit so you can have a tailgate party with your X5, but if you want to, it also helps keep things from falling out of the cargo area. And lastly, it has the effect of making this cargo opening a little bit lower and the lid go a little bit higher. So you can see I'm six feet tall. A tall person could very easily scoot around underneath this lid, and you couldn't do that in some of the vehicles with one-piece lift gates. This just ends up being a very practical design overall. This model also has a very handy button right here, which is a suspension lower button. This does have the air suspension on it, and pressing that button will drop the vehicle down and make it easier to put larger and heavier cargo in. At 33.9 cubic feet, this cargo area is a little bit smaller than some of the competitors' cargo areas. For instance, the Mercedes-Benz GLE will hold 38.1 cubic feet of things, but this is still considerably larger than the average luxury compact crossover. We had no problem fitting a decent number of those 24-inch roller bags in here, and some nice touches back here are 12-volt power ports. We also have the ability to fold down those rear seat backs from the rear cargo area as well. And although we don't find a spare tire under this load floor, it does have struts to help keep it open, and there is a decent amount of storage space available down there. And the last practical touch is that the tailgate doesn't just open, it also power closes, and of course we have a power close lift gate as well. Overall towing ability is one of the reasons that you might want to upgrade from a compact crossover into an X5, or move from something like a Lexus RX or a Lincoln Nautilus over to something like this because thanks to its rear wheel drive layout, towing ability is definitely higher than something like the Lexus at 6,603 pounds. The reason most likely that that is not a nice round number is because this is probably based off of a metric towing number and then they've just adjusted it for our imperial measurements here. In addition to the higher towing capacity, the way that the X5 tows versus especially the front wheel drive based entries definitely is something to keep in mind. This has an 8-speed ZF rear wheel drive transmission. It's basically the same transmission that we find under the hood of the Ram pickup truck line and it was designed for towing in mind. This X5 also has a full four corner air suspension. It does load level and that means that when you put tongue weight on the vehicle, it's going to return the rear suspension to its optimal ride height and it really improves your overall dynamics when towing. As we look around this interior, keep in mind that although we are driving the model with the base engine, this particular vehicle has about $14,000 of additional options. As we see in the BMW X5, we don't have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. I consider that kind of an odd omission because I find these shoulder belts positioned just a little bit low for me. The front headrests are a four-way design. We press this button to move them in and out, and then up and down is done electrically. This particular model has the optional leather upholstery, but these seats are not ventilated even though they are perforated. Continuing down the seat, you can see that we have fairly aggressive bolstering on the side and bottom cushions for a larger crossover. This definitely is my preference, and these seats also offer adjustment to that bolstering. The only hard plastics you'll find here are on the inside of the bottle holder at the bottom. You can also see BMW's latest design philosophy right here with some very striking wood trim. This is a highly polished wood trim. It's a little bit more linear than what we saw on the last X5. 
the overall interior design has changed versus the last BMW X5, but this is still definitely recognizable as a BMW from the shapes going on on the dashboard. We have this stitched upper section right here, more real wood trim, and then a pretty decently sized glove box down there. I had no problem fitting larger tablet computers inside. Moving to the center of the dashboard, we find BMW's latest iDrive infotainment system. This features Apple CarPlay integration, and it is, of course, wireless CarPlay, so I have a phone here. It is the one driving that CarPlay, but it's not physically connected to the system. Now, CarPlay is standard, but you can only use it for a year without actually paying for it. After that, BMW does charge you on a yearly basis. If we move over to the BMW interface, you'll notice that this is a version of what we have seen in the past, but it definitely has been updated quite nicely. It's pretty intuitive, easy to use, and most importantly, as you can see, now has a touchscreen interface. If you want to know more about this particular system, let me know down there in the comment section below. We will try and make a complete video just on the latest version of iDrive. Below the infotainment screen, we find the controls for the dual zone climate control up front. There are two extra zones in the back. We have some physical buttons down there and a small LCD, but you can also hit this menu button and then interact with some of those systems using that iDrive screen. Below those controls, we have a storage cubby right there hidden with a wood lid. This has a charging mat right there. There's also a USB port to the right of that and then two decently sized cup holders with a 12 volt power port right there in the middle. This particular model also has the optional heated and cooled cup holder, so you can press those buttons right there to keep your drink hot or cold. Behind the cup holders, we have a new button bank. These buttons are very shiny, so it is a little bit difficult to video them, and it's also a little bit difficult to see them yourself in strong daylight, so do keep that in mind. We have a button here to turn on and off the traction control, activate the camera systems that includes the 360-degree camera system in this vehicle, parking sensors right there, button to turn on and off the auto start-stop system in the vehicle, engine start stop button, drive mode buttons, sport, comfort, eco pro, and adaptive. This vehicle does have an adaptive air suspension, but these will also adjust the way the engine and transmission behave. We have an auto brake hold button right there, the electric parking brake, hill descent control, toggles for the air ride suspension ride height. So you can see normals right there in the middle. We can go up there to that height, or we can toggle it all the way down there to a more convenient access height. We then have the controller for the iDrive infotainment system over here. Very similar controller to what we saw in the last generation. There's an option button, back button, and then some direct access buttons to various system features. Navigation map, home, the connected services, option right there, media and communication. Between the front seats, we have a padded center armrest. We press that button right there to open it, and it opens in a bifold fashion. We have a somewhat small storage cubby for a vehicle this size. That's likely because the drivetrain is right under the storage area, although you could still store a variety of different GoPros. If you've ever wondered what we use for suction cups, now you know. Over on the driver's side, we have BMW's latest full LCD instrument cluster. This little module right here in the middle is a driver monitoring camera. It uses that to tell you whether or not it thinks you're paying attention. You then have the option of changing what you see displayed in some of the quadrants. For instance, we can cycle through our trip computer readouts right there, G meter, or information pulled from the Apple CarPlay integration. Moving out from there, we have an almost three-spoke wheel. There's sort of a split spoke right down there at the bottom. Shift paddles on the back and pretty aggressive sport grips up top. This has some of BMW's latest controls on the steering wheel. We have controls for the infotainment system over here on the right side, volume up, down, track, forward, backward. And then this knob allows you to actually pick items from your playlist using the heads-up display that we have on this particular model. There's a voice command button, a phone hang-up button, and then an input select button right there. It allows you to choose between media, Sirius XM, radio, etc. Then on the left side, we have the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system and, of course, the semi-autonomous driving system here. It's what we choose with this mode button right there. When the system is engaged, it does a pretty aggressive lane keeping assistance feature. And then it's hard to see on the steering wheel right here, but above the limit button and the resume cancel button, we actually have an LED bar right there. We also see the same one over here on the right side that will flash at you to let you know that that assist system no longer sees the lane lines and will not continue assisting you. In case you're curious, BMW has also updated the controls for the headlamps. You can see we have auto, off, high beams, etc. there, parking light buttons rather than a knob. When it comes to acceleration performance, the X5 really impressed me because this vehicle weighs nearly 4,900 pounds in this form right here. That's pretty heavy for a two row crossover, but even with this turbocharged six cylinder engine, which is the base engine, we ran from zero to 60 in five seconds flat. That actually makes this faster than an Audi SQ5, which is theoretically not only supposed to be a sport model, but also one size category lighter than this. 
Now, if you want to go even faster, there is, of course, the V8. There's also the plug-in hybrid, which may actually go faster 0 to 60 in this model. And, of course, the upcoming X5M, which, of course, BMW is not talking about yet. Although the model that we're driving here has 275 with tires, the laws of physics must be obeyed, and the overall curb weight does have an effect on the stopping ability. We stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 120 feet. That is a little on the long side, especially for a more performance-oriented entry like this. I actually had expected this to stop around 110 feet or so. You will find that kind of stopping distance in something like a base Porsche Cayenne. When it comes to our handling score, I'm going to have to separate handling feel from overall actual handling ability. The X5 handles very well. We have 275 with tires in this particular model, and the X5 has always had a good handling dynamic. But this model also has the optional adaptive air suspension, and that does help make things feel definitely floaty boaty. So out on our favorite winding mountain roads, we definitely get a decent amount of body roll. We definitely get some tip and dive out of this vehicle, just as you'd expect out of anything with an air suspension. The air suspension also likely has an effect on the overall steering feel because this doesn't have quite the same engaging feel that we found in the last X5, although that one we tested did not have an air suspension. When it comes to overall engagement, I would actually say that the Acura MDX with super handling all-wheel drive is a little bit more engaging than what we see in this X5. However, it's not necessarily going to actually handle better. It's just going to have a slightly more engaging feel. The interesting thing about the X5 is that if you can keep pushing the vehicle, push through the body roll, push through that lean that we see, uh, the slightly vague steering feel that we see, then we actually get excellent road grip. But again, that's likely down to the adaptive air suspension that we have in this model. Where you'll really notice the adaptive air suspension is out on a rougher gravel road like we're on here. This X5 is delivering an absolutely excellent ride over large imperfections and small imperfections. This overall air suspension tune actually reminds me a little bit more of a big Mercedes air suspension than some of the adaptive suspensions we've seen from BMW before. This is also a little bit softer and a little bit better controlled than what we see in the Volvo XC90, which is going to be a little bit less than many trims of the X5. But I think what I like most about the optional air suspension is that it appears to be a standalone $1,000 option. That's actually a pretty good deal as far as adaptive suspensions go, and it's definitely something that I would get in my X5. That's because I generally prefer a slightly softer ride, especially in a bigger luxury car like this. Now, if you want something that's a little bit more engaging, you want to skip the air suspension, but I suspect that most shoppers out there will probably be happier with this if they get it. Now, one thing to keep in mind is like other air suspensions, if the overall ride height is at its highest or at its lowest, so if you're taking this off-road a little bit, uh, then know that the overall suspension ride quality is going to drop because when this is in its highest ride height mode, it's pushed the wheels all the way down there to the bottom of their travel, and you don't have a whole lot of cushion left. Back out on the road, again, I have to say that I like the overall suspension balance in the X5. I do like something that's a little bit more comfortable. We can put this in a sporty mode where the suspension does tighten up a little bit, but again, it's still obvious that this has an air suspension. If I were to just sort of turn the wheel like this, you can see that we definitely get a little bit of body float in the X5. But again, I have to say that that actually is my preference. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, this vehicle came in at 69 decibels, making this one of the quietest cabins that we've tested. So when it comes to our overall cabin noise score, obviously I'm going to have to give this an A+. This is just about as quiet as the last Mercedes-Benz GLE that we tested. Hopefully we'll be able to get our hands on the new GLE very soon. Likely due to the overall curb weight of the X5, our fuel economy has been a little bit below EPA average. We've been averaging right around 20 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving in this. That's about 2 miles per gallon below the EPA score of 22. Now, if you want to get better fuel economy in your X5, there is going to be an option very soon for a plug-in hybrid system. I'm really eager to see what that one will be like. It's likely going to take up that entire storage area back there that is under the load floor for the battery, possibly even a little bit more than that, but there's still a lot of room back there, and that's going to give us 50 miles of electric range. It's also going to have the same automatic transmission that we find in this model, so it's probably not going to have any lower of an actual tow rating. Overall, out on the road, the X5 may disappoint some BMW traditionalists because the overall ride has become softer, the vehicles definitely become more luxurious and more comfortable over time, but personally, I like the fact that BMW has been moving in that particular direction. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below.
Before we dive straight into pricing, let's talk about one possible point of confusion here. Our local BMW dealer and another dealer in the Bay Area confirmed that BMW has canceled the third row seat. Now, there does seem to be some confusion around this because yet another dealer that we contacted said that the third row seat had been delayed and that they've actually never received a model with the third row seat, period. So there is a little bit of confusion about this. Whether or not you can get a third row seat now, whether you could before, whether you will in the future, in the United States in the X5. One thing we do know, however, is that the X5's configuration page on BMW's website does not allow you to add the third row seat option. A quick conversation with one of BMW's PR reps didn't exactly resolve this issue. He said that it was available, but he wasn't really sure whether it would be available going forward. So bottom line here is that I don't really know whether the third row is or is not discontinued in America. Maybe you'll be able to find an X5 out there with a third row, maybe you won't. Either way, if you really want a three row BMW, that's what the X7 is designed for. It has a much, much larger third row in the back. With that out of the way, let's dive right into pricing. The X5 starts at $60,700 at the moment. That's for the three liter turbocharged inline six engine and all wheel drive. There is no rear wheel drive version of the X5 in the US at the moment. Also missing at the moment is the X5M, although we do expect that to return at some point soon. If you want a little bit more oomph, you can get that 4.4 liter twin turbo V8. That'll set you back 75,750. All wheel drive is again standard on that model. That puts the X5 in a little bit of a different category than some of the competition. All versions of the X5 come well equipped from the factory, but there are a ton of options that you can select. So we're not gonna go into too many of those here. I'll just refer you over to BMW's website where you can configure all of those fun options there. We can get interior upgrades, a lot of different interior treatments, leathers, uh, wood trims, that sort of thing going on. And then of course the optional air suspension system, which I would recommend if you're looking for a more comfortable ride. BMW seems to call that air suspension system more of an off-road focused addition to the X5 but I personally think that its main function in the X5 is just to improve the ride quality. I don't see that many people taking their 60 to $90,000 SUV off-road, but if you are looking for a luxury crossover with an excellent street ride, that air suspension is definitely going to give it to you. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the most direct competitor for the X5, the Mercedes-Benz GLE, the artist formerly known as the ML. This generation of GLE is now available as a two row or a three row vehicle in the United States, which is kind of an interesting twist here since it looks like some of the smaller SUVs in this group are ditching their third row. Now the third row in the GLE is about as useful as the third row in the X5. It is fairly small. That's because if you want a large and more comfortable third row, Mercedes has a GLS for you, just like BMW has the X7. So X7, GLS, GLE, X5. Those are the direct competitive pairs. Mercedes is going in a slightly different direction when it comes to their engine lineup in the GLE at the moment. Now we do expect to see more performance oriented GLEs coming soon, but at this point in time, you have the choice of a three liter inline six like we see in the X5, or a two liter turbocharged inline four cylinder engine in the base model. That's the GLE 350. As with the X5, all wheel drive is standard, but performance is definitely going to be a lot lower in that base model than the base model of X5. That engine difference is the biggest reason that the GLE starts less than the X5 at $56,200. When you comparably equip the BMW to the Mercedes, the Mercedes is going to be a little bit more expensive, something that we see across their lineups. So if you're looking for direct comparisons, the GLE 450 is the more appropriate competitor to the base version of the X5. It starts at $61,150 and has Mercedes-Benz excellent mild hybrid system. Now the mild hybrid system in the GLE is not going to turn your GLE into a Mercedes Prius. It's not going to feel like that, but it is going to expand the ability of the vehicle to turn off its engine and save you gasoline in a wider variety of situations. It also provides a little bit of electric boost to help improve overall performance, especially zero to 60 performance and passing maneuver performance. And then of course it expands the ability of the vehicle to regenerate power back into the battery. Something that we've seen in luxury segment vehicles for a while now, but not in the same way that we see in the new Mercedes-Benz EQ mild hybrid system. Which one of these I like better is a little bit of a tricky question. I like the way the X5 looks on the outside better than the GLE, but I like the GLE's interior better than the BMW X5s. I like the look of the new Mercedes-Benz infotainment system that we see in the GLE, but I think that the BMW iDrive system is a little bit easier to use. I like the feature set of it just perhaps a little bit better, but again, the look and the overall feel of the Mercedes-Benz system. 
In terms of overall comfort, the two vehicles are very, very well matched. I love the new Mercedes-Benz inline six engine, especially that mild hybrid system, but I don't really care for the way the Mercedes-Benz automatic transmission shifts. It's just not as smooth as the eight-speed automatic transmission that we find in the X5. So if I could have a perfect pairing in this segment, it would be the X5's exterior, the GLE's interior, the GLE's engine, the BMW transmission. Moving along, we have the Audi Q7 and Q8. In my mind, the Q8 is really the more appropriate competitor to the X5 because even if you get the third row in the X5, it's a very, very small third row, and the overall vehicle is not the same size as the Q7. The Q8 features Audi's latest interior and exterior design. Again, I think that the X5 is a little bit more attractive on the outside, but I really like the new Audi interior. I like the overall theme, and I love the specific features that we find in the Q8, like the new Audi infotainment system with the huge display display in the middle of the dashboard. As I said, the Q8 is a two-row vehicle only, and at the moment there is only one engine. It's the V6 twin-turbo engine that we see in a wide variety of other Audi models. Overall, 0-60 to 60 acceleration appears to be a little bit below the BMW X5, and overall handling dynamics are a little bit different as well. That's because of the general layout of the Audi Quattro system that we see in the Q5, Q7, Q8, etc. Now that's not to say that the BMW X5 has the absolute sportiest driving dynamics in this segment, because this generation definitely doesn't. BMW has certainly gone for a slightly softer, slightly more comfortable suspension tune, and that does seem to have an effect on the overall handling. If you want the best handling vehicle in this segment, that's going to be the Porsche Cayenne. Unless, of course, we're talking about a future upcoming BMW X5, and then all bets are off. But the Cayenne is solidly one of the best handling crossovers you can get in America. Now the downside to that is that you will definitely pay for that extra handling prowess because the Cayenne is significantly more expensive than the X5. If you want a similar level of performance, expect to pay between five and $10,000 more for the Porsche than the BMW. That Delta grows as you work your way on up the trim ladder, so even though the BMW X5 with the twin turbo V8 seems a little pricey, the Cayenne is going to be more expensive. Some folks out there would argue that the Cayenne is worth every penny of its more expensive price tag, and on that point, I can't necessarily disagree, because the Cayenne has one of the best interiors in this segment, there's a high level of customization ability in the Cayenne, and the attention to detail, the overall build quality, is definitely a step above the average entry in this segment. It's just that it's going to cost you an awful lot more. Now let's talk about something a little bit different, and since the Lincoln Aviator, which is Lincoln's new rear-wheel drive crossover, isn't available yet, let's talk about the Volvo XC90. The XC90 has long been a favorite here at Alex and Autos. It's pretty inside, it's pretty outside, it's comfortable, relatively fuel efficient, it's very, very easy to live with. It also has a very practical cargo area and a relatively comfortable third row, even though overall it's not that much different in size versus the BMW X5. The main selling point for the Volvo, as always, is overall value. you notice that it starts an awful lot lower than the X5, although we do get a much less powerful engine in that base model XC90. You can also get a two-wheel drive XC90, and all-wheel drive is standard in the X5. But once you've factored in those differences, the XC90 is still going to be less expensive. Perhaps the best way to look at these two competing vehicles wouldn't necessarily be base model to base model, though. It would actually be some of the top end trims of XC90 versus the lower end trims of the X5. For instance, if you were to get an XC90 T8 plug-in hybrid, after tax credits, it's going to be about the same price as the base BMW X5. The Volvo is going to be a little bit faster. It's going to get 50% better fuel economy, be a little bit more comfortable on the inside as well. You'll also find a few features and functions standard in the XC90 that are optional in the X5. As I said before, the X5 isn't exactly the sportiest entry in this segment, but it definitely has a rear-wheel drive dynamic that we don't see in the XC90. The XC90 is not going to be as front-heavy out on the road as the Audi Q7, however, it still does have that similar driving dynamic there. You'll get a little bit of torque steer because we don't have a mechanical all-wheel drive system, and it's just not going to hold the road quite as well as those top-end trims of X5. But on the other hand, it's going to be significantly less expensive. In addition to the better value in the Volvo XC90, I also think it's a little bit more comfortable. Similar priced XC90s will get you more comfortable seats, massaging functionality, etc. that we don't see at those same price points going on in the BMW. On the downside, the Volvo has been around a little bit longer, so it's not quite as fresh as the BMW. Overall, I think that affects the infotainment system the most in the XC90, because I think the interior design and exterior design are still very competitive, but the infotainment system in the center console just doesn't have the same level of polish that we see in the latest version of the Mercedes or BMW infotainment systems. 
So what's my top pick in this segment at the moment? Well, I have to say that I am hard pressed to choose between the GLE and the X5, but since we haven't had the GLE for a full week to give it a detailed comparison, I'm going to have to pick the BMW X5. I have driven the GLE around Seattle for a few days, but I wasn't able to film it on that particular trip. So until we can get it here in-house for our complete weekly review, I'm gonna have to give my top pick in this segment to the BMW X5. It's better value than the Porsche, even though it's not quite as much fun to drive. And I also think it compares very well in terms of value to the value-oriented entries in this segment, like the Volvo XC90 and the Acura MDX. With this generation of X5, BMW has definitely upped their game when it comes to overall interior fit and finish, interior parts quality, and the overall comfort level. Some folks may be disappointed that the X5 is no longer the sportiest entry in the segment, but personally, I think that's just fine. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. What would you pick if you're in this segment shopping at around $70,000 or so? If you haven't found us over at facebook.com slash alexnados, be sure and click over there to see what we're driving this week. If you want to support this channel, click up there to the top of your screen. You'll be taken over to patreon.com where you can make a monthly pledge. I'll see you next week.